Hello, this is Chuck Ridgeway, Automation Technology Manager at Horner. Thanks for joining us for another Tuesday live stream. Well, today is part two of a three-part series where we're covering new aspects of the new OCSIO family of expansion and remote I.O. So today's specific topic is the OCSIO Digital I.O. Modules. Now, anytime we're exploring a new product, and in this case, OCSIO, I like to bring in my colleague, Casey Gardner, to help us explore it and learn about it. So I'm gonna bring in Casey right now. How are we doing, Casey? Hey, not bad, how's it going, Chuck? It's going terrific. Now, as we take a look at all the different digital I.O. modules that are available for OCSIO, what stands out with the group? Sure, I think there's a, a couple keys that, that stand out to me. For one is, is bringing back AC input support um, there's not a lot of other I.O. options uh, kind of out on the market that, that still truly support uh, native AC inputs. So that was something we would kind of gotten requested from customers for um, supporting retrofits is, is really where that kind of came to mind because it's not as common for new applications, but it is for some of those retrofit applications. Um, and another key aspect that we, we kind of thought of was uh, for higher current relay capability um, in a slice I.O. module kind of form factor as well. Um, we don't have a, a great amount of room for, for fitting relays like we used to, or at least for the changes in standards um, that have kind of come into place since then. So again, we, we basically tried to uh, have beefier uh, relay output capabilities where possible. And then again, we may look into some designs with a higher density relay capability in the future as well. Yeah, I really like the package, the compact package of OCSIO. It's really an elegant package, and it's really a challenge to fit a lot of relays inside that exact package, uh, when, especially when it comes to approvals, like you mentioned. So uh, we'll have to take a look at what some of the alternatives might be in the future if we decide that we need more density uh, for relays. But for now, we're at four channels, um, and we've got yes. some, that's right, and we've got some beefier current capabilities, as you mentioned as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Well, again, we'll see you next week when we take a look at OCSIO configuration. But for today, let's take a look at how we're breaking down today's topic. Okay. We're going to start by reviewing the digital IO lineup. What modules are available? Then we're going to cover some topics that can be a cause for confusion. Positive logic versus negative logic. Syncing versus sourcing. PNP versus NPN. Those are all terms that can trip folks up, especially when they're talking about sensors and digital I.O. So we're going to cover that. And then we're going to finish up with a module by module breakdown when it comes to specifications, wiring, and we'll give you plenty of application hints. Let's get started. Here's the lineup on the screen for the OCSIO digital I.O. modules. One of the most popular modules from a digital I.O. standpoint is our DIQ616. That has eight DC inputs and eight DC outputs. That's popular because in any system that has a significant number of I.O., that's the module with the highest density. And then we've got a couple of relay modules available. A mixed module with four digital inputs plus four relay outputs, and then a relay only module with a little bit more current capacity. As Casey mentioned in the open, we also have a eight point AC input module. And then don't forget about the two inputs and two outputs that are available from a digital IO standpoint in the CNX 116 base. So that's the lineup today for the digital IO modules for OCSIO. All right, next let's start talking about some of those topics that can be the cause for confusion. And we're gonna start out with positive logic and negative logic. So what is positive logic and what is negative logic? So positive logic, which is sometimes referred to as active high, is logic where a high voltage signal indicates an on condition or a one. And negative logic is logic where a low voltage condition indicates off or a zero. And then as we look at positive and negative logic as it relates to inputs, okay, as far as a PLC is concerned, let's take a look at that now. So on the right hand side at the top, you can see kind of a diagram for a positive logic PLC input. So we've got a 24 volt supply there shown with the plus lead running through 
the switch, and then when the switch is asserted, that plus signal is on the input terminal. So when the input terminal is on, it has 24 volts there. So that is positive logic because when we have high voltage, we have a one or an on condition. Directly below that, you see the traditional negative logic connection where instead of running the positive terminal through the switch, we run the negative terminal through the switch. And when the switch is thrown, we have zero volts for an on condition. And then in the lower left-hand side, in terms of wiring diagrams, we're showing another approach for negative logic wiring where the I.O. module or the input module itself provides the signal, which is run through the switch into the input terminal, which again is low voltage when on. Now, positive logic is by far the most common style of input, especially in the US and Europe, although uh, negative logic inputs are still popular in Asia. Okay, now let's talk about positive logic and negative logic as it refers to output signals from a PLC or an OCS in our case. Okay, now it doesn't change the definition of what positive logic or negative logic are. That definition stays the same, but let's take a look at what the wiring looks like. Okay, so for a positive logic output, when the output is on, you have a 24 volt signal on the output terminal. Okay, that is then run to the load. And then with a negative logic output, when that output is on, you have a low voltage signal running to the load, and then separately, you have the positive voltage connected to the load outside of the uh, output module. So one of the things that some people think is that negative logic outputs are somewhat unsafe because if the wire connecting the output module to the load, which is a negative wire, if that were to fall off, then potentially the load would turn on because of the external connection of the plus voltage to the load. So that's one of the reasons why negative logic outputs aren't used very frequently anymore because of that potential for an unsafe condition. Okay, so we've talked about positive logic and negative logic. Now let's talk about a couple other terms that you'll hear and that is syncing and sourcing. And let's start with syncing and sourcing inputs. Now in general, a syncing circuit is a circuit where current is flowing into a device and a sourcing circuit is a circuit where current is flowing out of a device. So let's take a look at syncing inputs and sourcing inputs. At the top right, we have wiring for a syncing input. Okay, you can see the current is flowing into the terminal for a syncing input. Okay, and then at the bottom there, we have a sourcing input where current is flowing out of the input. And you can see that based on the wiring diagrams from our previous slides, syncing inputs correlate to positive logic and sourcing inputs correlate to negative logic. Now when we take a look at outputs, again, the definition of a syncing circuit and a sourcing circuit does not change. But when we take a look at the diagrams, we can see that for a sourcing output, we have current flowing out. For a syncing output, we have current flowing in. So in this case, a sourcing output correlates to positive logic and a syncing output correlates to negative logic. So that's kind of the relationship between syncing and sourcing and positive logic and negative logic. Now let's talk about PNP and NPN. And these typically, at least from an automation standpoint, refer to sensor outputs. You're typically talking about, you know, what does the output look like on a sensor? Is it PNP? Is it NPN? Is it something else? Okay, so a PNP sensor will have an output that produces a positive signal, whereas an NPN sensor will have an output that produces a negative signal. So when you take a look at compatibility between a PNP sensor and a PLC input, or an NPN sensor and a PLC input, you'll see that they require different types of input. So for a PNP sensor, it needs to be wired to a positive logic or syncing PLC input, whereas an NPN sensor need to be needs to be wired to a negative logic or a sourcing type 
PLC input. So that's where PNP and NPN come into play when you're trying to match your sensor output types and your PLC input types. Okay, now let's take a look at the different modules that are available for OCSIO, starting with the DIQ616. It's got eight DC inputs and eight DC outputs, and that density, which is currently the highest density we sell, helps make it a very popular module. From a highlight standpoint, I would say the highlights on the input side are the fact that you can use either 12 volt or 24 volt signal levels with this module, and you can choose to use either positive or negative logic, although all eight inputs will need to be positive logic or negative logic, there's no mixing and matching. On the output side, you've got eight pretty beefy half amp outputs at 24 volt DC, uh, only available in positive logic. The outputs are short circuit protected and there are two groups of four as opposed to just one group of eight. Okay, from a specification standpoint, one of the things that stands out to me on the input side of things is just the fact that this is a 24 volt solid state input. Uh, it's got pretty fast response with one millisecond switching time and a pretty typical 10 kilohertz input impedance. From a wiring standpoint on the input side, let's take a look at that next. Now for positive logic wiring or syncing inputs, you just connect the plus lead from your 24 volt supply, run it through your input switches and into your input terminals, and then the minus side of your supply wires to the zero volt terminal. Now for negative logic, you take advantage of the zero volt terminal and you connect that and run that through your input switches uh, into your input terminal. So that is negative logic or sourcing input wiring. Now there are some extra zero volt terminals available on the module. They're all at the same potential. They're just there for your convenience. Now from an output specification standpoint, probably again the thing that stands out the most there is again the switching time, which is pretty rapid at one millisecond. And again, you've got nice short circuit protection with the output drivers as well. And then from an output wiring standpoint, again, it's positive logic only, organized into two groups of four, and you can see what the wiring looks like there. You've got two different voltage inputs to run your two different groups of output. So the V1 input connects the DC voltage that routes through to outputs one through four, and the V2 input connects the DC voltage that routes through outputs five through eight. All right, now let's move on to another mixed module. This is the DIQ512. The DIQ512 has a total of eight IO points, four inputs, and four outputs. Now on the input side, pretty much the same specification that we just talked about with the DIQ616. On the output side though, instead of solid state DC outputs, we've got four relay outputs with a pretty nice rating of three amps per point. All the output relays are isolated. What we mean there is that they're not commoned together. However, if you want to common them together yourself, we do provide extra terminals to make that easy. So that's something you can do in the field. Now, as we take a look at the specifications, again, nothing different about the inputs from a specification standpoint as compared with the DIQ616. Let's take a look at the wiring that also looks similar, right? I'm only showing the positive logic wiring there. It also does support negative logic. Again, wired in the same fashion as the DIQ616 inputs. Now, as we look at the outputs, that's where obviously we see some differences because we're talking about relays. So a couple of things I will highlight here from a specification standpoint. Again, the three amps rating per relay. Also, the fact that there is 500 volts of isolation between the contacts and the ground on the module. Uh, and a couple other things. The relays are type 1A and the expected mechanical life of those relays is approximately 100,000 cycles. Now from a wiring standpoint, one thing you'll notice here again is you've got isolated outputs. In other words, each relay is wired completely separate from, uh, from each of the others. Also we're showing in the wiring diagram fuses. 
Anytime you're using larger relay loads, you should definitely look at fusing. And of course, the rating for your fuses are going to be dependent on your load sizes and your wiring gauge. All right, the next module we're talking about is a relay output only module. So it has four relays and it does not have any digital inputs. Now what makes this module different is the fact that it has beefier relays. So you've got higher current capacity per relay and a higher current total capacity for the entire module. Also, one other thing to note, and that is that because of the extra current running through this module potentially, it only has a 50C max rating uh, from UL. So that is a little difference between this module and all the rest of the modules in the line. From a specification standpoint, you'll see, again, the only real differences are the higher current ratings on the relays. Uh, you still have the same expected life, the same isolation to ground, and as you would probably expect, the same wiring diagram. Although again, the loads are a little bit larger or can be a little bit larger. All right, now let's talk about that AC input module that's available, the DIMM 620. The highlight of the DIMM 620 is the fact that you can use it with retrofit applications which require AC type inputs. So the maximum voltage, as you can see, is 120 volts AC. You've got one group of eight inputs. You've got easy common distribution because you've got all kinds of common terminals available on the terminal plugs. And one note, all the inputs must be on the same phase. Now from a specification standpoint, the one thing that kind of sticks out to me is the fact that AC inputs are obviously not as fast switching wise as DC inputs. And that should be no surprise really. If you remember, our DC inputs would switch in about a millisecond or so, whereas the on to off response and vice versa is closer to 20 milliseconds with AC type inputs. Okay, from a wiring standpoint, very straightforward. You just take the hot side of your signal coming out of your sensor, wire that through your switches and into your input terminals, and the neutral side gets wired to the common terminal on the module. Very straightforward. Okay, finally, we don't want to forget about the built-in I.O. that's available in the CNX space. We've got two flexible inputs and two DC outputs. From a highlight standpoint, the big deal about the flexible inputs, at least when you're talking about digital I.O., is the fact that not only do they support 12 volt and 24 volt levels, but they also support 5 volt levels as well. So if you have any TTL level uh, type sensors or signals that you would like to connect to your system, the CNX base has a couple of flexible inputs that are 5 volt compatible. Also, another thing is the output current capacity isn't half an amp, which is already pretty beefy, but it's two amps per point. So that's again a nice bonus when it comes to extra current capacity with the CNX116. From a specification, uh, again, the inputs are very similar in just about every way from a specification standpoint when it comes to digital I.O., except for the fact that you can support those extra voltage levels, the five volt level and even a custom level if you've got some sort of oddball sensor uh, that has some weird thresholds you'd like to support. From a output specification, nothing really sticks out here except for, of course, the higher current capacity. You've still got the short circuit protection that's available on the other modules with solid state outputs. And then from a wiring standpoint, you can see the wiring for inputs is shown on the left. The wiring for the outputs is shown on the right. Nothing really different there. Now let's talk about the plugs that are used with the digital I.O. modules. Okay, all the plugs are either six pin or four pin, and they're all removable. They're also spring clamp style. What that means is that if you utilize ferrules, then you don't even need a tool to insert your wiring. You just need a tool to remove your wire. Now, also, every terminal point is labeled and silkscreened, so it makes it very easy to make sure you get the right wire 
in the right terminal location. Now we actually use two different styles of plugs. They're both removable. One is a six pin, one is a four pin. Now from a rating standpoint, they're nearly identical. The only real difference is the voltage rating, which shouldn't really come into play with OCSIO. And in addition to a small screwdriver you might need for uh, removing wires, you're also gonna want a medium sized screwdriver for ejecting your plugs. Now. Uh, one thing to note is that we have other videos that show you know, how you put OCSIO together, how you add the wires, how you remove the plug. So check our uh, YouTube channel for additional videos that can show you that. All right, now some final tips and tricks when it comes to digital IO wiring. Make it easy. Don't use wire that's larger than it needs to be. For most IO wiring in most systems, 18 AWG will have plenty of current capacity and it will be very easy to work with. You can see in the lower right hand corner there, I'm showing you the NEC uh, National Electrical Code machine tool wire rating chart for the different gauge wire from 18 down to 10 at least. And you can see that even 18 AWG has six amps of capacity. And there's none of the modules in the OCS IO family that has any IO points that are rated for higher than five amps. So 18 AWG, at least from OCS IO to your field terminal strip, should be sufficient when it comes to the wiring that you use. Also, if you do use ferrules, and I talked about the fact that if you use ferrules, you won't need to use tools to insert your wiring, I would recommend from a ferrule standpoint, the ferrules that come with a slightly longer barrel, the 10 millimeter barrel. If you use those, it's just gonna be a lot easier to get not only the wires in the right place, but also to remove them if you need to. Okay, well that wraps up our topic for today. I hope you found it useful. Now, I want to remind you before we wrap up, that we have another advanced OCS class coming up next week and there are still seats available. So if your schedule is open, I'd get on the phone with that supervisor of yours and tell them that you wanna go to the Horner Advanced OCS training course uh, to really improve your skills, not only from a Horner standpoint, but just from a PLC programming standpoint in general. This is where I remind you we're here every Tuesday at two o'clock with a new video either fully live or streamed live with someone standing by to answer your questions. Next week, it's all about configuring OCSIO. You don't wanna miss that topic for sure. Okay, now don't forget, this is the 10th year anniversary of Horner Lighting and there's lots of great lighting videos available on our YouTube channel, so check those out. I know a lot of us are automation engineers, but there's more lighting in the automation world than you might think, and certainly in the industrial world, so check out those Horner lighting products. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, don't hesitate, we promise not to spam you. And if you do choose to subscribe, as well as choose notifications, then you'll be notified every time we go live or every time we post a new video. Okay, so until next week, when we talk about OCSIO configuration, Let's all get out there and do us some good. Mm -hmm.